closing session of day one of India Space Congress 2020-22, talking about demystifying, I request everyone's attention, demystifying US export control regulations, ITAR and EAR for the Indian space sector. I would like to call upon Mr. Jason Chuen, US Department of Commerce, Bureau of Industry and Security to join us on the stage. Then I would like to call upon Dr. Susmishta Mahanti, Director General, Spaceport Sarabhai to take over the meeting. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. So I'll be the moderator for this session. My name is Susmita Mohanty. I've been in the space sector for more than 25 years. I started with a brief stint at NASA Johnson in 1997, and then I went on to work for Boeing in uh, Huntington Beach in Southern California for the space station program. And in the last 20 years, I've co-founded three small space companies, one in San Francisco, one in Vienna, in Austria, and one in India, in Bangalore. Today's session, the focus is on export control regulations. For those of you who have been in the space sector, um, we just had a defense um, uh, session here, and we did talk about exporting of technology in one of the last questions. I think most of you who have been in the US space industry or have had to deal with the US space industry must be familiar with the abbreviations ITAR and EAR. So ITAR stands for International Traffic in Arms Regulations, and EAR stands for Export Administration Regulations. So what, what exactly is ITAR and EAR? Think of these as part of the US export control regime that uh, puts restrictions on the manufacture, the sale, and export of certain technologies to countries outside of the US. And these technologies, especially in the space and defense domain, usually need to go through certain clearance procedures before they can be sent outside of the United States. The ITAR regime started way back in the Cold War times. There has been some amount, some degree of reform, um, but probably not enough. Uh, I think during the Obama regime, uh, one of the reforms, what they did was they moved certain articles uh, which were under the purview of the Department of State to the Department of Commerce, the ones which were less sensitive in nature, in order to expedite the, the export control licensing procedures. So today we have with us, uh, as a not here in the room, but they'll join us from the, from the US, uh, two speakers. The first one is Alex Duville. Uh, Alex is part of the State Department Directorate of Defense Trade Controls. Uh, it's called DDTC, for those of you who are familiar. In fact, when I moved back to India in 2008 and launched um, what is often quoted as India's first space startup, uh, we incorporated a company here in India in Maharashtra and we also incorporated uh, Earth to orbit in San Francisco in the state of California. We were representing a Stanford startup which was called Skybox Imaging, which was interested in launching its satellite on the PSLV. So my company, the San Francisco entity, had to sign a document with the DDTC um, assuring them that all of the ITAR protocols will be followed when the satellite is flown into India comes to Chennai, goes to the spaceport in Sri Harikota by road, goes through checkout tests, integration, and launch. 
So Alex works for DDTC. He is the division chief for light weapon systems. And he's also the acting division chief for space, missile, and sensor systems team. Alex serves as a licensing department's supervising coordinator for cases involving congressional notification and UN notification. Interestingly, Alex, his educational background is in history. So he has a bachelor's in European history from Union College and a master's in US military history from Temple University. Um, so it's a bit of a technical jugglery we have to do here to make sure that Alex and the second speaker, Jason, uh, will be connected and they'll be presenting here uh, through a Zoom link. So, um, Desh, are we ready yet or can I introduce the second speaker as well? just introduced you to our audience here in Delhi. Uh, Alex, can you hear me? Is, is there a way Alex can confirm? So I think over to you, Alex. I just introduced you to the um, audience present here in the hall. And you can take over from here and start presenting to us. Uh, and if you have any technical issues, you'll have to let us know. Over to you, Alex. Yes, I can hear you, Alex. Just, just give me a second. Uh, I can hear Alex, but I don't think people here can hear Alex yet. Alex, 30 seconds, please. Uh, I can hear you loud and clear. We're just making sure the, um, the audio in the hall works as well. Just stand by, please. It's Can we do a voice check, please? So we've had the IT liberalization in India for over two decades now, and we are still fiddling with basic IT stuff to try and get Alex in the room here from DC. I think this is, we could have done it a little more seamlessly. I think that's, that's exactly where, having been in the space world for so long, I always say our IT sector. I mean, this, this could have been done in a much more simpler fashion. So Dustin, Alex can hear me loud and clear. How come the audience is unable to hear Alex on the... It's a bit of a mystery, Alex. We are trying to sort it out for you. So, so we should we see, should see Alex. That's just the camera in the room.
Okay, Alex, we can now see you. So hopefully we can hear you in a bit. Um, can we amp up the volume because we can see Alex clearly now. Okay, step one, check. You visible. It's a clear feed, no pixelation. We're just waiting for the sound to kick in. So Alex, can you uh, talk to me so we can check if the sound's uh, coming into our feed here? I can hear you, but I don't think the audience can hear you yet. Okay, Alex, we are... Let me know when you want me to start. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sorry for the technical glitches. Uh, for I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Uh, unfortunately, I'm stuck in D.C. But I wanted to give you just a quick overview of Directorate of Defense Trade Controls, uh, where I work, and. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's late there, so I kind of want to get to Q&A, so I'm just going to give a brief overview. We, uh, my office is the Director of Defense Trade Controls, and it falls under, in the State Department, under the T family. There are many bureaus. T Bureau is one of them. T Bureau is the Undersecretary for Arms Controls and International Security, and we are one of three main offices within that bureau, I mean that, that uh, family. Uh, we are the Office of Assistant Secretary for Political and Military Affairs, and the other two are ISN, the International Security and Nonproliferation uh, Bureau, and the Arms Control and Verification and Compliance Bureau. With under the Political and Military Bureau is three offices: Regional Security and Arms Transfer, which is the RSAT team. They handle FMS and regional security issues. Uh, FMS is uh, foreign military uh, sales. Uh, there is my office, which is the defense trade office, which handles the exports and imports, temporary imports of defense articles, commercial sales of defense articles. And then there is the security and negotiations and agreements office as well. Um, furthermore, our office is divided into 
four sub offices. Uh, one is our management office. Uh, one is our licensing office, which I am, I am a division chief in. Uh, the, the third one is the office of policy uh, and, and controls. They handle the reg writing for the ITAR. They handle commodity jurisdictions uh, to, to determine if something is, in fact, on the on the USML list, the United States Munitions list, and is the defense article. And then there is the compliance office, which handles uh, uh, law enforcement issues and uh, handles the compliance issues of uh, and, and enforcement of of the ITAR, the International Trade and Arms Regulation. So the DDTC mission is to ensure that our exports, U.S. exports of defense articles and defense services advance U.S. national security and foreign policy objectives. The main takeaway on this slide is that we are primarily concerned with U.S. foreign policy and national security. Our, we, have a, we are not necessarily concerned with uh, promoting trade or, or, or the business climate. Uh, that is a sub factor of what we do is to promote U.S. trade, but our main goals is to ensure that uh, the U.S. basically the U.S. warfighter and our national security interests are protected. Uh, that is a change or a shift from the, uh, the difference from us in the Commerce Department. The Commerce Department, uh, one of their goals is, which you'll hear about, is to actively promote uh, a trade, and ours is that's a subset of our mission. So basically, uh, we have two ways to go about doing our, our exports of defense articles. We have the commercial side, which is controlled under the ITAR, International Traffic and Arms Regulations. That is my office. Uh, and there's, there's the Export Administration Regulations, which is EAR, which is controlled under the Commerce Department. Uh, a few years ago, we shifted through export control form, we shifted some of the articles from the USML to Commerce Department. They are still controlled uh, under, you know, mostly under Series 600 uh, under munitions, but they are no longer controlled under the ITAR. Now, on the, on the flip side, there is government to government exports. Those are handled through the Foreign Military Sales Program run by our sister office. Uh, RSAT, Regional Security Arms Transfer Bureau in PM, and as well as foreign military financing and security assistance. Those are separate uh, parts of the same coin, I guess. One is direct commercial sales uh, between industry and the foreign party, and one is gov to gov relation. To further kind of talk about the differences between state and commerce, this is a, a handy little chart, uh, which basically, when you see all the acronyms, which U.S. government loves acronyms. You see acronyms. Uh, this is kind of lets you know where and which uh, ones fall under which uh, which office. So our my office, DDDC, our legal authority is through the AECA, the Arms Export Control Act, and the implementing regulations of the AECA is the ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulation. That is the book, the Bible, if you will, of how to uh, conduct defense trade for uh, U.S. munitions list items. On the other side, Commerce Department is controlled by the ECRA, and their export regulations are the EAR, uh, and their list is called the Commerce Control List. So this is just a little chart to kind of, uh, and they handle dual use items and technology. So this is a, if you see some acronyms and you want to know where they fall, this is uh, where they are. The USML is divided into 21 subcategories of commodities. Uh, DDTC is unique in, in, in the State Department as we are divided not by regions, uh, but by commodities. So my team, I am the division chief of two teams, the space and missile team and the, and the light weapons team. Uh, we handle cases from all over the world for those commodities, not just a region. So we don't just handle cases from, say, uh, Central Asia, we handle, my team handles all cases for all countries for our specific commodities. The transfers that require 
our authorization are, there are many. We handle permanent exports of defense articles. We handle temporary exports of defense articles for trade shows or testing. We handle re-exports and retransfers of defense articles already exported to other countries. We also handle the temporary import of defense articles uh, for like training or testing and whatnot. It is important to note that we do not handle permanent imports into the United States. That is handled by ATF, uh, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Department, uh, and they and there are separate rules and regulations for permanent import. Uh, we also handle defense services, and those are handled under technical assistance agreements, manufacturing and license agreements, and WDAs, warehouse and distribution agreements. Those are uh, for when there are not just hardware involved, but we have, there's, there's uh, you want to transfer technical know-how, you want to have discussions, detailed discussions about commodities, about, about defense services, when that happens, you de tend to need a technical assistance agreement. The life cycle of an export authorization. This is an interesting, uh, this is a good process to know, uh, especially it's mostly handled by the U.S. applicant, but it's good to know how the our process works for the foreign party because it is and can be a detailed uh, process. What we do is... A, when a case first comes in, cases come in through electronically through a system called DEX, D-E-C-C-S, and U.S. applicants have to register with us if they're a manufacturer or an exporter or importer of, 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 US, of stuff on the USML, and they submit their, their license to us, and we do an administrative review. We make sure that all the documents are, are, are provided. We need purchase orders. We need end user statements. We need... Uh, uh, DSP 83 NU certificates, if required. When an applicant asks you in a foreign party, you know, a foreign party for these documents, this is why they're asking for it. They need to know. Uh, they need to have stuff on letterhead from you guys. They need to know what the articles are. They need to know what the value is. They need to know what the specific end user is and the end user purpose is. Uh, they're, they're asking that of you because we need that in order to process the case. When the case comes in, we will check to make sure that all of the required documents are in place and the forms are filled out correctly. If so, we will then go to interagency review. We will then staff that case out to different offices within State Department and outside State Department to do their uh, assessment of whether the case should move forward or not. Within State, we send it out to the regional bureaus, we send it to the Human Rights Department, if necessary, and to our sister office, RSAT, Regional Security and Arms Transfer. We also send most of our cases to DOD, and they do the, uh, and they do the national security review. They will review the case for national security uh, implications and provide us their position. This, the staffing agencies within state are done for foreign policy review. And then on top of that, we also send out on a case by case basis to other agencies that may be involved in, in the, the transaction, could be the Department of Energy. We could go to NASA. We could also go to uh, MTCR, uh, the Missile Technology Control Regime, uh, for non proliferation issues. So we will staff the case out to them and we will get their staffing positions back. Typically, staffing positions have 30 days to review the case. If there are significant foreign policy or national security concerns, uh, that review time may be extended. Uh, once we receive the positions back from the staffing agencies, then we co consolidate and collect, and we will, uh, if uh, everyone agrees, we will issue the case. If there is a non-consensus, we will have to work that non-consensus out through uh, other channels, uh, we have working groups and we escalate the cases as necessary. Uh, there are certain cases on top of the administrative and interagency review that require additional scrutiny by different parts of our government. One is congressional notification. Certain cases require that meet certain thresholds, mostly monetary, uh, would require to 
to be notified to Congress. Cases that require congressional notification typically take longer than normal cases. Normal cases are we are averaging about 48 days uh, for average processing time for all cases, for all regions, all types of cases as an average. Now, congressional notifications can take up to three to six months, depending on what the articles are and what the, the countries involved and what the transaction is. Uh, cases that go to CN, we send to the Hill and they have a chance to ask questions. If the Hill asks questions, then we may reach out directly to the applicant or we may have to reach out to the end user uh, and the foreign parties to answer some of those questions. So if you do receive uh, questions, uh, from the applicant, and they may be related to a congressional notification and it is so required. Once a case comes back, like I said, we will adjudicate, uh, we will consolidate all of the positions from the staffing points and we will issue the case uh, as, as, as required. Now, that's just a brief overview of, of what we've done, but the important for in terms of this audience is that once we export something is exported to a foreign partner or, or a country that does not end our U.S. jurisdiction of these articles after that initial export. We, we require any time you want to re-export something to another country or re-transfer it within the, the country that it was uh, delivered to that was outside the scope of the original license, then we require uh, authorization to do that. Now, foreign partners can can submit these requests on their own. They don't have to go through the U.S. applicant. U.S. applicants can request these retransfer or re-export requests on behalf of the foreign partner, but they don't do not have to. This is the one time where foreign partners can actually apply for their own license through the DEX system without being registered with PDTC. Uh, so when you need to do anything, if you get something exported to you and you need to do some additional testing or you need to retransfer it or you want to resell it to somebody else, you would need our permission uh, or authorization to do that. So for the DCS, you would, for DCS cases, you would have to go in through us, uh, DDTC, to get those. That form is called the DS6004 form, uh, basically what the old general correspondence letters were. If you had something that you was exported via FMS, uh, or foreign military sales or gov to gov direct military financing, then you would have to go to our sister office, RSAT, uh, to get a TPT, the third party transfer uh, authorization. I know we it's, it's late and we want to get to BIS, but uh, I wanted to give you some reference material. This is our DDTC website. Uh, and our customer service site if you need help with getting onto DEX or, 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 or submitting uh, retransfer requests. The last one down there is the ITAR regulations. It is on our website and it is the up-to-date version. Uh, for, for you can go there and, and, and look at all our regs, look at all the stuff that is on the USML and uh, everything you need there for, for, for uh, what our regulations are for exporting defense articles are found there. I wanted to let you know of a, an additional website, which was run by DOD, uh, which is called ELISA. It's L I, I'm sorry, E L I S A dot D T S A dot M I L. That is ELISA dot D T S A dot M I L. That is where you can go and check the status of cases. Uh, you can check the status of cases if you have the case number for uh, initial exports, but also for re-exports and re-transfer requests that you submit. That tells you who the applicant, I mean, who the uh, licensing officer is, tells you who the offices were staffed out to, and it tells you when those positions came back. Unfortunately, it does not tell you what that position was. So while it may say, if you staffed it out to four different offices and it says, date that it was returned, it may look like that the case is ready to be issued as a favorable, but we do, you do not know by looking at that system what the positions were. So we may, if there was a non-consensus, not everyone agrees, we may have to take additional time to make sure that that case 
that we come to an agreement about how we want to adjudicate that case. If you have any additional questions, if you have any additional questions, please reach out to me. Uh, my name is Alex Louisville, and I don't have my my website. So I guess hidden on my Zoom screen here, but my email address is there. Please reach out to me for any questions you may have, uh, and I will answer them as expeditiously as I can. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. So we will take questions, Alex, before we move on to Jason, uh, because we don't want to lose you on the feed. So I'll open. I'll open, I'll open the flow for questions for Alex. Um, do we have any questions in the room? Any ITAR related questions? Alex, I would like you to, so I did solicit a couple of questions among lawyers in the country who are familiar with ITAR, and I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first one is, um, how are export control regimes evolving in a time where technologies are becoming omni-use? That's from one of the lawyers who is familiar with ITA. Yeah, it's, that, that's a difficult question. Uh, as you know, technology changes so fast that it's hard for the regulation to keep up with the new technologies and new uses for equipment. Uh, that is why we have, in, in the past, we've had PCR control reform, uh, which we've moved articles from the USML to the Department of Commerce. That is an ongoing process. Uh, we and they take into account new technologies, new uses, and we will, you know, try to review that list and come up with solutions to to uh, issues that come up when technology. Uh, has that used to be all military or, or defense controlled are now maybe uh, used more for dual use purposes or more strictly commerce purposes. So we, we do factor that in, but it, it is a slow process and we do periodically review the, the regs to try to account for that. I know it's a slow process and I know it may not be as fast as you as industry would like, but we do have that process in place. Uh, and drones are there. We don't have a separate commodity for drones. They are either they are either in. Uh, category four missiles, rockets, and torpedoes, or category eight for aircraft. Uh, they're they're contained in those. I I know we are reviewing those categories right now uh, to try to ca capture new technology as it unfolds and a as it comes down, especially in terms of like uh, optionally piloted vehicles and and loitering munitions. Uh, there will be. I think there there will be some additional guidance uh, and uh, changes to the ITAR involving those involving those articles in the future. Over. say definitely email me with any questions you have if you have any that come up after this panel and if you can share this you know, uh, my, my PowerPoint presentation out uh, I 
know I kind of breeze through it, but there might be some, some good information for people in the audience to have as, as, as a takeaway. Thank you. Okay, so now we move on to the second speaker for this session. Uh, the second speaker is Jason Chauvin. He is a senior engineer with the Sensors and Aviation Division with the U.S. Department of Commerce and Bureau of Industry and Security. Um, can we have Jason join us on Zoom? Okay, Jason, uh, you're already there. So, Jason, over to you. Uh, if you can start sharing your screen and uh, start your presentation, we are we're here, ready and waiting.
So thank you everybody for being patient um, with this tele-presentation. We have to wrap up now because we have to vacate the hall. So I'll uh, hand it over to you, you. for the final remarks. Thank you. <laughs>